Class, why does a wealthy man act like he's wealthy? Why does a millionaire act like a millionaire? You know why? He believes it. That's all. He believes he's a millionaire. He believes he's wealthy, so he acts like it. Huh. Upon what authority does a wealthy man then believe and act? I'll tell you. He's got his broker's report in his hand. He's looked at the broker's report. He's got his banker's report in front of him. He's got his certified public accountant report in front of him. Does he have the million dollars laying right in front of him? Then upon what authority does he believe he's a millionaire, he's a wealthy man? Because of his reports of the stocks and bonds, the banker's report, the accountant's report. And those reports are only in writing, but he believes that writing and he acts like it. Class, if a man of the world can walk by man's word, the reports of the brokers, the bankers, the CPAs, if a man can act like he's a millionaire and hasn't got a million in front of him, if he can act wealthy, but none of that wealth is laying right there, he's acting only upon written reports that are in front of him, can I, as a son of God, walk less? I have before me a written report, which is the report of his word, that word which never fails, that word which is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That word which has not one iota of error in it. Therefore, I, as a son of God, I walk the talk and I talk the walk of the word. What others say about it doesn't matter. If I'm a wealthy man and I got my banker's report, you know what the neighbors can say? Nuts to the neighbors. <laughs> That's right. I got the report. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've got the report. How long are we going to trust a banker's word more than the word of God? Most people do. They'll trust their CPA. They'll trust their stocks and bonds, the reports they get. But when it comes to God's word, we beg off. You and I have to claim the promises of God's word like a businessman claims the promises in the secular world of business. The Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. What he has promised, he's not only able, but willing to what? That's right. And his promises are yea and amen. They are a surety, a certainty. Remember, God says, prove me. Try me out. See if I'll not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. You haven't even got a bushel basket big enough to get him. Class, I didn't die for you. I didn't take your sins, your transgressions. I didn't take the yoke of bondage. I didn't take your sicknesses. 
but there is one who did, and we not only have it in writing, we have it in experience by the manifestations to know he's alive. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his what? That's why it's no longer on us, it's on him. I believe that report. I act that report. I walk that report. The devil wants us to believe it was a wooden cross because he knows there's no power in that wooden cross. And as long as he can keep people talking about Jesus Christ bearing that wooden cross and keep them away from the cross he really bore, the cross of sin and the cross of the consequences of sin, he's got everybody believing the wrong report and manifesting fear, frustration, defeat, anxiety, and you got to pop pills in early in the evening to go sleep at night. Then you got to drink something in the morning to wake up simply because we have not believed the report. Isn't that some place in the scriptures it says who has believed our report? You know who believes? The men and women who want to hear the word of the Lord. The men and women unto whom the cross is not foolishness. The men and women unto whom it is the power of God unto salvation. Take a look once more tonight, class, to Matthew 27, verse 32. And as they came out, they found a man of Serene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. Not the spiritual cross, but his wooden cross. And in Mark chapter 15, and in verse 21, and they compel one Simon of Serene, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And in Luke chapter 23, Luke 23, and in verse 26 of this great chapter, and as they led him away, they laid hold upon one called Simon of what? a Serenian, coming out of the country. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it, what? After Jesus. This was a tremendous inconvenience to Simon of Serene. Simon of Serene had come a long distance to Jerusalem because it was the Passover time and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and to partake of that Passover. But while he was coming into that city on the day before the preparation on Tuesday of Holy Week, as we refer to it, he just happened to be at a place where they were leading a man out called Jesus. And they laid hold on Simon of Serene and compelled him to bear the wooden cross, which was a contamination to him. He couldn't go back in the city that night and participate of the Passover. But well, we read a record in Mark that tells us he was the father of Alexander and what? Rufus. And if you'll follow the word of God, you'll see that the word of God got back to the Serenians. I wonder who took it back there. A man whose life was interrupted from what he wanted to do with something greater. He bore that wooden cross for the Lord Jesus Christ, but bearing that cross must have changed his life 
because when he went back to three, he couldn't go to Passover because now he was filthy, you know, contaminated. He had only one place to go. He had to go back home. But I'll bet he never went until after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he went back, he was hot. That's right. <laughs> Boy, he was just glowing with the greatness of what he had seen because his life was changed. Some of us have traveled those religious circles, you know, headed the same place the same way, and we got involved someplace along the line. Somebody said, hey, do you really believe God's word is God's will? Do you really believe it means what it says and says what it means, and God has a purpose for everything he says, where he says it, why he says it, how he says it, to whom he says it? And they sit it there and say, nope, never believed it that big. And you sort of disrupt them, and you take them aside, and... You give them a little bit of the word, and their lives begin to change. I thank God for the interruptions in my life that have made it possible for me to get to the word. I thank God for the times when I wanted to go a certain way, but somehow or other it just seemed like somebody took a hold and compelled me to bear the cross. It changed my life like it changed Simon and Serenium. Only three verses in the Bible mention the man. But all of us are mentioned in the word, for he laid on him the iniquity of us all. What a wonderful Savior. This should be a tremendous week for the ministry of the way around the world. Because we're not going to promote the wooden cross, we're going to set forth the real cross which Christ bore, which is your sin and mine, your iniquities and mine, the yoke of bondage, and our sickness. Those are the two things, basically, that he took out of the way and nailed to his cross. And he doubled it, and he wrote your name on the outside in all of its perfection and all of its beauty. I still don't understand why anybody would want to refuse such a Savior entering into their lives. Remember that old record in Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open at the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. You and I have to open the door. Our Savior Jesus Christ, our God, doesn't come around and beat people over the head. He doesn't, he doesn't knock us down. He simply opens his word to us by a fellow believer. I think tonight again I must say to you, God has no hands but our hands with which to give people bread. God has no feet but our feet with which to move among the almost dead. We say that we are his and he is ours. Deeds are the proof of that, not words. And these are the final proving of. 